The easiest way to think about behavioral economics is to think about what it's not. Classical economic theory holds that people are entirely rational and that they always make decisions and judgments based on an almost cost-benefit analysis. In other words, you, people deliberate, they weigh up all the possible variables, um, they consider how they're going to maximize their benefit and minimize the cost. So that's what classical economic theory is about. Behavioral economics challenges that view based on decades of psychological experimentation, which challenges it, says that human beings are wired to be biased in the way that they think and make decisions. It's almost like we've all got cognitive biases, they call them. So we make less than perfect decisions. And it doesn't really matter sometimes because less than perfect decisions work. They help us function in the world. But sometimes they do lead us astray. And that's kind of what behavioral economics is all about, how we can get led astray, how we may seem illogical to someone else, how we may seem irrational or unpredictable. But to ourselves, we're entirely predictable and rational and organized. So that's kind of where it sits. I think behavioral economics has come to the forefront of people's minds because from 2002, when an economist called Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for Economics, he was the first behavioural economist, and he described some of these cognitive biases, these distorted ways of thinking that we all have. And as a result of his work, many different people started to write popular books. Nudge, Predictably Irrational, Malcolm Gladwell's Blink, John Kay wrote a book called Obliquity, Influence, Mark Earls has written Herd, which is about herd behaviour. And there's just been this plethora of articles, new books, and a huge interest from governments, both in the States and in the UK, because one of the applications of behavioral economics is not only just understand behavior, but how to change behavior. So governments who are involved in public policy, like how to get people to eat more healthily, how to pe stop people smoking, all sorts of things like that, are absolutely ripe for behavioural economic principles and thinking. It's become popular because what it focuses on is behaviour, human beings' behaviour. And it's not about what people say they're going to do in the future or what their memories are about what they might have done in the past, which are often reconstructed anyway and not truthful. It's about actual behaviour. And that's what so many organisations, whether they're government or, or, or businesses, are trying to do is to figure out how to change people's behaviour. I think we do have to let go of the idea that um, attitude, opinion, beliefs precede behaviour. Because a lot of evidence suggests that the other way around, that if you change your behaviour, for example, if you lose weight, you continue to eat more healthily than getting your head into losing weight in the first place and then deciding to go on a diet. Many other examples of where behavior leads attitude rather than attitude preceding behavior. If you watch the royal wedding and I ask you why, you might say, well, it only happens every couple of decades, or I was interested to see what she looked like, whatever. The reality probably is that there was a far more emotional reason, and also a social reason, because everybody else was. And you're much more likely to be unaware of the fact that what other people do around you, and how they behave, has often far more influence on you than your beliefs about your own intrinsic decision-making, which is individual. I think the big challenge for marketers is somehow letting go of their control model. I always think that many organisations are a bit like Fortress Brand. They have these huge walls and behind which you know, they, they kind of plot and scheme and aim at individual consumers with their sort of you know, best archers, you know, trying to target them so that, you know, they will, human beings will do what they want them to do. 
And I think it's a, a sort of a letting go somehow of that power that an organization can influence people's minds in a way that they'll change. So I think that what it boils down to is that they have to understand how people make judgments and decisions and then work with the grain of how people make judgments and decisions rather than trying to say, oh, we can't deal with that, so we're going to do it our way. One of the principles of behavioral economics is that human beings will not make much effort to do things. So the easier you can make something, the more they like it. For example, default choices, um, which you see all the time. You go on the internet and it makes the process with as few clicks and windows as possible and you'll do it. Whereas if you have to spend time and fill in forms and the thing doesn't work properly and you lose one window and one window comes up here, you give up, you know, after maybe what, five, six seconds? So, you know, we fundamentally will do things um, when they're easy to do. And I think retailers have understood that. So when they queues a checkout, you know, Tesco decided to say only one in front of you or something and open more checkouts or, you know, that sort of thing. That's what I mean by making things easy. And that's, that's one of the sort of fundamental principles. <laughs> one of the other behavioral economic concepts that I like is called the curse of knowledge, which means that if you're an organization or an individual, you assume that other people have the same knowledge as you have. So an organization will assume that its customers or potential customers will know something about it because they know all about themselves. You know, and that's, that's one of the sort of fundamental mismatches between organizations or businesses or marketers and, and customers. The reason I think that we at Acacia are, are interested in this, and, and me personally, is that throughout my career, I have always understood that human beings don't say what they think, do what they say, and sometimes even believe what they do or don't do. And I started off working for someone who was psychoanalytically trained, Bill Schlafman. For him, understanding human beings was about understanding their deeper motivations, often of which they were not conscious. So he you know, developed many of the projective techniques that we use today to try and get underneath consciousness, the cognitive consciousness that behavioral economics talk about. You know, a little bit later, there was the growing understanding from neuroscience. And neuroscientists have proved beyond any doubt that human beings make decisions, primarily emotionally, that many decisions, and most of what we do, in fact, is um, underneath conscious radar, otherwise, you know, the way we walk, the way we eat, where we go, what we do. If we had to consciously think of everything that we do every minute or second, we, we wouldn't even be able to get out of bed. So, you know, there was further evidence, if you like, from my experience of, of, of research and talking to hundreds and hundreds of people, whether in groups or individually or however, that people don't have access to some of the reasons why they do some things. With the best will in the world, they will try and explain but they don't really know. And essentially, we're incredibly poor witnesses to our own motivations. So the reason that I'm involved in it is because it seems to me the easiest way to explain to clients and organizations why it is that human beings behave the way they do. For me, I think the future of research is about qualitative researchers being able to deal with very complex quantitative data as well. Mark Earls and, and John Kieran did this great paper where they showed purely from Google Analytics that the fear of swine flu was a mental and emotional thing rather than a reality. And what they did was they got information about how many people were actually hospitalized um, with swine flu on an ongoing daily, weekly basis. And then they were able to find out how many people went online to get information about the swine flu and, and what to do and what the symptoms were. And, you know, the graph of real behavior was like this. And the graph of anxiety, if you like, was huge. So they were able to show quite neatly that actually it was much more a hyped 
social effect than it was a real individual response to an illness. Um, and, and that's, I think, is a great example of how we're going to have to use um, much more sort of complicated data and learn to work with that first and then use qualitative methods to maybe bring it to life, maybe to, to bring some of the um, behavioural economic understanding of cognitive biases you know, into it or become more useful to clients in terms of how we can point them to towards helping people change behaviour, not just diagnostically, this is what they're doing, and, and, and possibly, right, that's your problem, you go and sort it out. You know? that's, I think where researchers often stuck.